At the dawn of home video game systems, one of the easiest ways to compare consoles was their graphical capabilities. The ColecoVision could display 15 colors at once, the NES had a 256 by 240 pixel resolution, and the Vectrex, well, the Vectrex had monochrome graphics and a zero pixel resolution. But of the three, I'd say that the Vectrex is probably the most capable. To really understand why though, we're going to have to take a look at what other consoles were doing to generate their graphics at the time. Essentially, the two measures of graphical capabilities are the number of pixels on the screen and the number of colors that can be shown by each pixel, and the limiting factor for both of those was memory. To draw an image onto a TV screen, the video hardware needs to be able to hold the image to be drawn in a location called the frame buffer. The more complex the image gets, the more memory the frame buffer needs to hold it. But in the late 70s and early 80s, memory wasn't so easy to come by and so the graphics on many home consoles of the time had small color palettes and lots of pixelation. Even earlier consoles like the Atari 2600 dropped the frame buffer altogether, instead having the CPU race the beam to generate on-screen graphics as the TV was tracing them out. Arcade cabinets on the other hand looked a lot better. For some titles, that can just be attributed to more memory for the display and a faster CPU than most consoles. But it also didn't hurt that many arcade cabinets also used a display technique called vector graphics. See, on a traditional CRT television, the beam sweeps across the screen horizontally, moving down vertically slightly with each line. This works great for putting video onto the screen, but for anything digital, this means we need to break up the image we want to show into pixels. For a console that plugs into a TV, this is pretty much what you're stuck with. The CRT and the TV will always trace out the same raster pattern, meaning the only properties of the beam that can be controlled externally are brightness and color. Arcade systems, on the other hand, aren't designed to plug into a TV. Instead, they contain their own CRT, which gives the hardware designers license to use it in more interesting ways. In the case of vector graphics, by allowing the CPU to control the beam position, so that it can trace out the outline of an object rather than the raster pattern. Not only does this make line art much easier to draw than being converted into pixels, but it also gives a much sharper image, since on a vector display there is no frame buffer or raster lines, and therefore no pixels. And it would be the sharp graphics that vector displays produced that the Vectrex, brainchild of John Ross of Smith Engineering, was attempting to capture and bring from the arcade into the home. Now the history of how this console was first developed is an interesting one, but really I'd rather talk more about the strange, strange hardware quirks that the Vectrex contained under the hood. Compared to other consoles of the time, the thing is definitely unique. The form factor of the console alone already sets the Vectrex apart from most of its contemporaries. At about the same size as a classic Mac, the thing contains its own 9-inch monochrome CRT, and dang, for an image with zero pixels, these lines almost look too sharp to be real. What you're looking at is the game Mindstorm, built into the ROM of the Vectrex, though other games can be added in the cartridge port along the right of the device. Many games also attempted to add color graphics by using specially tinted transparent overlays, which sat in front of the display here to tint certain regions of the image. The controller part of the Vectrex folds right up into the base of the device, making it pretty compact when put away, but removing it reveals the combination power switch and volume knob, the reset button, and another controller port. In terms of programming, working with a vector display is considerably different from working with a bitmap display. The Vectrex doesn't have any concept of a frame buffer, meaning that anything the CPU draws on the screen will only last for a fraction of a second before it needs to be drawn in again. And unlike a bitmap display where the CPU rates to a frame buffer before letting the hardware handle the video signal, in the Vectrex, the CPU has to handle all on-screen drawing manually. It works by first setting the speeds for the X and Y directions, turning on the beam, then integrating the beam position based on those speeds and hardware. Essentially, every time the CPU wants to draw a line, it determines how fast to move the beam and then waits for the beam to get to that location. This ends up being pretty convenient for scaling graphics, since all it takes to double the size of an image is to wait twice as long for each vector to draw. The beam speeds can stay the same. But this integrator approach also ends up being somewhat of a curse. Since the programmer can only control the speed at which the beam moves, it can't be moved to an absolute position, like the top left corner. Only relative positions, like 100 spots up. In other words, every line you trace starts out from wherever you left off. It also doesn't help that, since the beam control circuitry is mostly analog, there's also a bit of drift with the beam integrators, meaning that if the beam moves around too much, pieces of the image will no longer line up properly, and suddenly you've got a broken teapot. That's why in most programs, it's a necessity to recenter the beam after every couple draw operations. 
The graphics on screen on the Vectrex need to be drawn in software with each frame or else they'll disappear. Which means that if a program is running slowly, in addition to creating a choppy video, the image will begin to flicker. Now of course, the phosphor persistence of the screen gives a bit of leeway in terms of time before a frame needs to be redrawn. Officially, the Vectrex BIOS is set to update 50 times a second. With a 1.5 MHz 6809 for a CPU, this means the Vectrex has about 30,000 CPU cycles per frame to update and redraw the screen. Pretty tight, but still enough time for some pretty cool graphical effects. One of the more interesting aspects of the Vectrex is that a majority of the beam control hardware is actually analog. In fact, the only real digital part of it is how the CPU controls it through an MC1408 digital to analog converter, or DAC. Thing is, in the 80s especially, DACs of any decent precision weren't the cheapest components around. So in an effort to keep the price of the console down, the Vectrex actually only uses one DAC, and shares it between the screen and audio hardware through a multiplexer. At any point, the CPU can select a channel like X-Speed, Y-Speed, or Beam Brightness, and output an analog value to it. Through analog op-amp magic, the output can maintain that voltage level even when the DAC is disconnected from it. Because of how the multiplexer is set up though, not all output channels can be modified individually. For example, setting the vertical beam speed will also set the horizontal speed, but not vice versa. This does allow for some pretty cool looking effects, where the beam speed is changed so quickly it appears to trace a smooth curve. Looking closely though, you'll see that any curvature only happens from left to right, since only the horizontal speed can be changed individually. Speaking of DACs, the construction of the Vectrex also wasn't too keen on ADCs, or analog to digital converters, most likely for similar reasons of cost. Instead, the Vectrex was able to read the analog joystick in a fairly creative way. At any time, the CPU could set an analog level through the DAC, and then check with an analog comparator to see whether the joystick level was greater or less than the CPU's level. Then the CPU could try another voltage level, and through just a few steps approximate the precise position of the joystick. This ends up being particularly useful for fast-paced games, since if the full 8 bits of precision aren't required from the joystick, the CPU can quit reading early and continue with a less precise, but more quickly measured joystick value. The internals of the Vectrix are certainly something to behold, and that's not even mentioning the audio of the thing, generated by a General Instrument AY38910 synthesizer chip, and also featuring that signature Vectrex hum, the result of an improperly grounded audio line in early production models. Still though, the engineering behind GCE's one-of-a-kind tabletop arcade gets even weirder upon seeing the hardware add-ons that were made for the device. The less interesting of the two was the Vectrex light pen, which, using a photo detector on the tip, was able to measure light intensity readings as the CPU drew lines on the screen to work out where the pen must be. Certainly not anything new by this point, and not something that would go away anytime soon. The other add-on for it, though? Well, this one was just a little crazy. Not only was the Vectrex the first home vector graphics console, but for owners of the 3D Imager, it was also the first stereoscopic console. Inside this blocky mask you attach to your face, there's a plastic disc. One half is transparent, like the colored overlays, and the other is opaque. Through careful timing based on this notch in the middle, the Vectrex console could determine which eye was being covered as the disc spun in front of the user's face, and would draw the view from the visible eye. Not only that, but through even more careful timing, the Vectrex could also color objects by drawing them whenever the desired color filter covered the eyes. Of course, synchronizing with a spinning disk is particularly difficult on the software end of things, so the CPU was also able to control the rate at which the viewer disk spun, to help keep it more consistent. The result is a surprisingly effective method of stereoscopy. I obviously don't have a 3D imager to test myself, but you can see from this video here by Vectrex Rolly that the imager does a decent job of isolating each colored object in each of the two visual frames. Pretty impressive for a purely mechanical method at stereoscopic 3D, especially for one that would beat the Segascope 3D glasses to the market by a few years. Tragically, as much of an engineering marvel the Vectrex was in terms of the creative and forward-thinking ideas that went into it, success was just not in the cards for GCE's console. It ended up being released at the worst time possible in 1982, not long before the video game Market Crash of 83, which effectively killed off any of Hasbro's interest in selling the console. There was later talk in Smith Engineering of creating a handheld successor to the console, but that idea never really went anywhere, effectively bringing an end to the Vectrex. Only 29 games were ever released for the console before its discontinuation in 1984. But despite its fall into obscurity, the Vectrex continues to have an active cult following to this day.
This was helped in part by J. Smith of Smith Engineering placing all Vectrex IPs into the public domain, making nonprofit homebrew development and distribution totally legal. It's that, alongside the more exotic hardware of the Vectrex, that continues to attract software developers daring to push the thing to its limits, even now. After all, nothing says overcoming hardware limitations quite like making incredible graphical displays on the console with zero pixels.